Alright, so today we're going to start um, chapter 6, which is the beginning of trig. So what I like to do is just look at, look at the word. And just break it down. So is there any part of the word that anyone recognizes? Either prefix, suffix, something in the middle? Yeah, try. Try? As three as in triangle. All right, so try is a prefix for three. Yeah. Yeah. The part that's like um, metri. Metri. geometry. Metry. Yep, so you see that in geometry. Yes. It's the only other place you really see it. But does anyone know what metri means? Or does it look, does metric kind of look like anything else? Metric. Like metric? And the metric system is used to do what? Measure. Measure things, right? It's a system of measurement. So, measurement. And then there's one more part of that that you do see uh, in geometry. It's in the middle of the word, but it's usually at the end of. Oh, gone. Gone. Like shape. Yeah, like hexagon. Yeah, and what does gone mean? Side. Side, or side, yeah. So the idea of trigonometry, if you break it down, it really means three-sided measurement or measuring triangles. Okay? When we talk about measuring sides, it also includes looking at angles in trig. But that's, that's the main idea. Right. Is there any question? So an example of something you could do in trig, uh, it's called triangulation. It's basically figuring out where something is based on two other people looking at it in different spots. So I would say you had, um, had like a fire in like a forest where you could see smoke and there were two towers which would be known where they are, right? It's like knowing where cities are on a map. You can look up where the towers are and, and figure that part out. So we could find the distance between these two towers easily. Maybe they're 50 miles apart. And each one of them can see the, the smoke. Okay? They see the smoke in the distance. Um, the problem would be is if they, they can just see it, they might not know exactly how far away the smoke is. Maybe it looks like it's 30 miles away, maybe 35, 40 miles. Um, but there might be a reason why they want exact coordinates. Right? Maybe if you had like a, like a drone that could, could drop water on it, you want to program in the exact coordinates of where you want it to go. And if you're five miles off, well, there might not be a fire five miles away. So they got to program where they want it to go. Well, this tower would be able to see the fire, and they would have, they could look out their window, it's usually all glass, so it can see everywhere in one of those towers. And they'd have a compass, and they could say the direction and see the smoke. But that's all they could do. They could just say the direction. This tower could do the same thing. They could say, well, we see the smoke coming from this direction. And knowing the direction that each tower sees the smoke in, what it does is it gives you a triangle, kind of like this. And you know that angle, that angle, and you know the distance between the towers, then you can figure out exactly where the, where the smoke is coming from. But you need two people to do it. GPS works kind of the same way. You've got satellites instead of towers, and it's also 3D, but the GPS, the satellites know where they are relative to each other, so they can talk. And then they can pinpoint where an object that uses GPS is. And the more um, towers and more satellites you have, the more accurate you can, you can locate something. But that's one example of something we could hear in trade. So the nice thing about trig is there's lots of examples I can show you that will apply to things that are more practical, okay? whether it's like a, like a construction kind of thing or a, an application like that. There's a lot of things I can tie it into. Uh, not everything. There are some things we do in trig that are more theoretical, but a lot of trig is very practical. Okay, any questions on that? All right, so we're... We're a ways away from doing something like that. But we're going to talk about kind of the most basic thing that we can do in trig, which is just angles. Okay, what are, what's an angle? How do we measure it? Uh, different words to describe angles based on their size, things like that. 
Now, first of all, when you talk about an angle, there's really two different two different ways you can think about an angle. You can think of it as inside of a shape, or you can think of it as off to the side, kind of by itself. But whether you're talking about this or that, they're both angles. The difference is in a polygon. What do we what do you call these two things that are making up the sides of that angle? Array. What are these? Arrays. Um, like a, a ray. In in a polygon, these two things aren't rays because they don't go on forever. They are They're not lines because they also don't go on forever. They're just sides. And the sides are what? What do you call it in geometry? It has a certain name to it. Segment. A what? Segment. Line segment. Yeah. So in a polygon, you can have two line segments coming from the same point to make up an angle, or in the picture on the right, you do have two rays. Okay. But these are both considered angles. One's in a polygon. One's by its. Okay, so some of this probably going to be revealed. So an angle that's by itself is made up of two rays, and the two rays have to start at the same point, and that's called the vertex. Now there's two rays, right? So two rays make up the sides. One side is called the initial, and the other side is called the terminal side. Okay, so we have to know which, which side is which. So let me label it in this picture. Bottom is the initial, and that side would be the terminal. Now let's say I, let's say I rotate. I do this. Well, this side is still the initial, and this side over here is the terminal. The idea is the way, the way you figure out which side is which is if you have two rays and you're standing in between them, if you rotate counterclockwise, Whichever side you would end at, like if you went like this, that's the terminal. The terminal is where you end, and where you start is the initial. Okay, so as you rotate counterclockwise in between the rays, you end at the initial. You end at the terminal, and you start at the initial. So when I write down CCW, that stands for counterclockwise. CW uh, would be clock. I got another picture right there. So the initial side is the one that's on the bottom. The terminal side is the one that's pointing up and to the right. And the red arrow shows you the direction. Like if you were rotating counterclockwise, where you hit at the end, that's the terminal. And where you start is the initial. Now you really have two different angles. You've got the angle that's in between the two rays. And then you also have the angle that's outside. When we talk about the angle, we're usually talking about the inside piece. The inside there. That's the angle we're talking about. Okay, so any question on that idea of like initial side and terminal side? Now, when you draw an angle, there is a certain way you should draw it. Like if you're going to draw, let's say, a, a 90 degree angle, you, you shouldn't really go like that. Okay, that, that's kind of like it's been, it's been tilted. So if you really want to draw a 90, it should look, well, that's not perfect, but it should look more like that. The idea is the initial side should always be horizontal, and it should point to the right. 
Okay, and I'll tell you, uh, there's a name for that. Okay, I'll tell you what that's called in a second. What's CTW again? Counterclockwise. No. Okay, when we um, when we don't know an angle, okay, we're going to be solving for angles sometime. We just have to refer to an angle. Um, we usually use a Greek letter to represent English letters. Lowercase letters are usually used for sides in a triangle. Greek letters are used for angles. Now, some textbooks will use English letters for everything. They'll use like Small or lowercase letters for sides, capital letters for angles. But then it starts to get confusing. Because then if I like, say I use the letter C, you can't really tell if it's capital or lowercase unless you look at it with other letters. So that gets confusing. And then even if I ask you like on a test, if I say like find A, well I gotta make sure I put the capital A or the lowercase A. If I use Greek letters, they look totally different than English letters, so there's no confusion. Greek letters are angles, English letters are sides. We're not going to use all of these today, but we'll just kind of go through these and which ones they are. So this is the first one. Does anybody know what Greek letter that is? Alpha. Yep, that's the Greek letter for alpha. These are all lowercase. Capital alpha looks like capital A in English. Okay, so alpha. Uh, how about the next one? Beta. Yeah, yeah lower, lowercase beta. Uh, the next one kind of looks like a Y, but it's got a little bit of a hook kind of on the left side of it. <coughs> Anybody know which Greek letter that is? Not sure. Uh, delta, well, lowercase delta looks kind of like a D, and capital delta looks like a triangle. Um, so it's not, it's not delta. It would be a good guess you'd think that would be the next one we use. Uh, but this is gamma. So that's the Greek letter for gamma. Uh, how about this one? The circle with a line in the middle. That theta. one you see a lot in geometry. Theta. Theta, yeah. That's theta. And then the last one, it's kind of like a W, a little loop in the middle, and the sides kind of curve in a little bit. Um, and it's the lowercase version. Anybody know what that one is? The capital version looks like this. That's omega. Yeah. So we don't really use the capital. If you do anything with like resistance or ohms, you might talk about that in physics or electronics or something, but we don't, we don't use that. When you have to do angles in a triangle and you're missing all three, these are generally the three that we use, alpha, beta, and gamma. Just the convention, we normally use those three. If you're talking about a single angle all by itself, like not part of a shape or anything, a lot of times we'll use this one. And the omega, that one comes up um, when we do transformations. So we've done you know, shift, stretch, reflect for every function we've studied. We're going to do the same thing with trig functions. We'll shift, stretch, and reflect them. And that, sometimes that's one of the letters they use. Yeah? So omega's transformations and theta is what again? Um, theta, I've seen that just when you're talking about a single angle, like... I'm going to do something like this in a second. Um, I'm going to give you a definition of an acute angle, and I'm just going to say it means it's between 0 and 90, and I'm going to use that to represent my angle, theta. So I've seen theta when you're just talking about a single angle, all by itself. And again, it's just a pattern. It's not saying you have to. You can use any, you can technically use any letter you want to represent an angle, even English letters. But we'll stick with group letters just to keep it. So theta is basically the equivalent of x. Yeah, like x or y or yeah, any variable. X and y are used a lot in algebra. Theta is used a lot in trig. Yeah. All right, so I told you that there's a way that we usually draw angles. So it makes the initial and terminal side easy to see. That's called standard 
position. For an angle to be in standard position, two things have to happen. One, you draw the vertex of the angle right at the origin. And two, make sure that the initial side is horizontal and pointing to the right. That would mean it's on positive x-axis. Here's an angle in standard position. That's perfect. Vertex at the origin, initial side on the positive x axis. Okay. How about if I did that? Now, what's wrong with that? Vertex isn't at the origin. Initial side is good, vertex isn't at the origin. Um, how about if I did something like this? No. Now the vertex is at the origin, but the initial side isn't on the x-axis. It looks like the terminal side is on the y-axis, but that's not, that's not part of the definition at all. The initial side is to be on the x-axis. That's you. So what that does is if I ask you to sketch, say, a 45-degree angle, everyone should look pretty much the same. Right? There shouldn't be angles that are kind of like rotated or shifted. They should all start at the origin and pretty much look just like that. Any question on that idea of standard position? Yeah. I didn't label it this up here. This is the terminal. Okay, so one unit that we can use to measure angles is degrees. Um, there's another unit we're going to talk more about later on. Um, but does anybody know the other unit? Yeah? So it's minutes, seconds, and then isn't there a third? So you can break an angle into degrees, minutes, seconds. We don't really study that. You can. Um, so there's another way, but we don't do it that way. Uh, it's another unit that we use besides degrees. Radians. Yeah, so we'll talk about radians. If you look in the book, they do talk about degree minute seconds, DNS. And I think on the calculator, um, the calculator can do conversions with degrees minute seconds. Yep, yeah. option four. Uh, actually, I haven't tried it. Let's take, let's take like 40.5 degrees. If we convert that, Let's see. Angle. Option four. If we convert it to degrees, minutes, seconds, that's 40 degrees. And then 0.5 is 30 minutes. Yeah. So what they what they do with degrees, minutes, seconds is they break the decimal down. So half a degree is 30 minutes. If you had like 60 minutes, that's a full, full degree. Um, we just we don't we don't do it that way. I just know it's really popular for like inspecting angles and machining. Minutes and seconds? Yeah, once you get into like the super tight tolerance. So. so like if I had, let me see, I don't really play with this a lot, but if I had something like that, that's a quarter of a degree. So what's a quarter of a minute? How many? 15. 15. So it's 40 degrees, 15 minutes. It's a quarter. The 15 represents a quarter. Right, but again, not something we're gonna we're gonna do at all. But yeah, it is used. It is used. I've never seen it. What's that? I've never seen it in the real world, even doing like, injection molding stuff. Yeah, so we, it's in a whole degree. we'll stick pretty much with degrees and, and radians. Um, now, if you had one full rotation on a circle, does anybody know what uh, the degree measure would be? You go all the way around the circle, one full rotation. 360. 360. Now, when you move on a circle, there are two directions. There's the clockwise and counterclockwise. And depending on which way you move it, it does change your angle. 
but let me show you what the difference is. All right, so this is a program that lets me draw different angles, uh, and I can move the terminal side, but I can't move the initial side. So as I rotate counterclockwise, I get a positive, positive number, and if I go all the way around one time, I get to 360. That's so unsatisfying. What's that? That's so unsatisfying. Why? It doesn't need. Oh, it doesn't quite. Oh, the red? Yeah. Oh, it's because it's trying to show you how many times you've gone around. So it keeps spiraling the more times you go around. <laughs> so now it shows you you've gone around uh, through 1080. That's um, three revolutions. So that's, that's a counterclockwise. What kind of angle do you think I would get negative. if I started at zero and now go clockwise? Negative angle. Yeah, negative. So in terms of movement on a circle, the only thing that a negative means is direction. When you talk about angles in like a polygon, well, there is no such thing as direction, like in a triangle. And you'll notice there's two numbers here. There's this negative 76 degrees. What do you think that number on the bottom is? That is, that's radians. And you'll notice every now and then you get to a certain angle, like 45. And what do you notice is all of a sudden in that angle? Pi. Pi. So radiance has a lot to do with pi. Okay? And most of the angles on the circle that are multiples of 30 or 60 are going to be shown with a fraction of, with a pi. If you just pick a random angle and just kind of stop anywhere, I'm just going to give you the dust. But we're going to talk, how do, you, how do you get that fraction with pi? Okay, I'm going to show you that uh, in a little bit. Okay, so that's one complete rotation. Um, what if you did a half rotation in the counterclockwise direction? What would that be? Yep, that would be 180. Of course, if you went in a clockwise direction, that would be a negative 180. Um, what about a quarter revolution? in the counterclockwise direction. That would be 90. Yep. So we'll start to get very familiar with like 30s, 60s, and 45s, because those are angles we'll use a lot. Any questions on any of those numbers? Again, when you talk about certain shapes, sometimes certain angles are too big to be in the shape. Like in a triangle, you'd never have an angle that's 180 degrees. That one's too big. Maybe in like a, an octagon or something, you could have an angle that big, but not in a triangle. All right. I just met, mentioned that to you guys. So angles measured in the counterclockwise direction are positive. And in the clockwise direction, they are negative. No. Okay, and again, this idea of positive and negative, it really just applies to moving on a circle. It doesn't really apply to when we talk specifically about like a triangle, like an angle in that. Okay, and I do little arrow so you, if you know like counterclockwise, you think like that's like you're loosening something. Clockwise, that's like you're tightening something if you're a mechanical person. Um, okay, I showed you that too. Angles larger than 360, that can happen on a circle. And that just means you've gone around more than one revolution. In general, going around more than one revolution is, is complicated. Uh, it makes the angle bigger, makes it harder to work with. So we're going to learn how can we take angles that have gone around more than once and simplify them to a smaller number. And of course, when I say simplify, I mean simplify, but don't mess up the problem. So you can simplify it and still get the same answer. It just gives you an easier number to work with. Alright, so let's look at... Can you go back to that for a second? 
Okay, so I'm going to look, actually, before I even go to the next page, I'm going to bring that diagram of the angle back up. And I want to show you two different angles, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. Okay, I'm going to draw 90 degrees, and then I'm going to draw 450. Okay, so here's there's 90. And what I want you to focus on is where the initial side and the terminal side are. So look at the initial side, look at the terminal side. Now I'm going to draw 450. How do the initial side and terminal side compare now to where they were before for 90? Exactly the same spot. In fact, if that red spiral wasn't there and you couldn't see this, couldn't see that, you wouldn't know the difference between 90 and 450. Or between 90, 450, and no. You wouldn't be able to tell the difference between any of those. So there's a name for that. Okay, when you draw different angles like I just did, 90, 450, 810, and the initial and terminal sides end up at the same place, those are called coterminal angles. So angles that have the same initial and terminal sides are called coterminal angles. Now let me show you the nice thing about coterminal angles. Okay, we just had three of them. We had 810, 450, and what was the first one? 90. 90. Okay, let me show you something on the calculator. Now we're not going to learn about sine, cosine, and tangent today, but we are going to learn about them either tomorrow or Wednesday. I'm not sure. We're going to we're going to look at them later in the week. All right, let me type in. Right, let me type in the sine of ninety. Notice what you get. You get one. Let me type in the sine of four fifty. One. The sine of 810. What do you think that's going to be? Three. Three. One. I was right. Yeah. So all, the, all of them come out the same because these are all coterminal. So if you asked me to do something with 810 degrees, I would rather make that number smaller, like 90. And then I know, even though I made it smaller, I'm still going to get the same answer. It's just making it smaller it gives me something easier to work with. So the question is, how can you make it smaller? What can you do to 810 to change it to 450? And then we can do the same thing again to change it to 90. Yeah? Subtract by 360. Yeah. Anytime you add or subtract 360, you're finding an angle that's coterminal because you've just gone around one extra time. So to find coterminal angles, you can add or subtract 360 degrees. So let's say you gave me an angle of, I don't know, 2,010 degrees. You wanted me to figure out something about it. I think, well, that, that's kind of complicated. 2,010 degrees, I've gone around a bunch of times. So what I would do is I would minus 360, and I would keep doing it until I get something small enough that I can work with in my head. In 210, that's an angle I can work with. It's a multiple of 30. It's 30 times 7. And it's between 0 and 360. Now, if I do it too much, well, now I, now I went negative. So now I don't want to be negative either. So to fix it, you can add 360. So the goal is to always work with an angle between 0 and 360 if you can. Yeah. Uh, does the calculator have modulo? Does the calculator have what? Modulo. Um, because you can also do that, right? I don't know if it has that. Um, so if we just look up, let's see, looking for the letter M. So I don't see mod there. Yeah, I know in computer languages the percent symbol is used for mod modular math. Um, 
If it doesn't have it, you could program the calculator to do it. But I don't know if there's a button for it or if it's called something different. I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. My calculator got this for all those sign numbers. It okay. Into the mm -hmm. So when you look at the top, yours says radians right there, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So when we start using the calculator to do some of these things, um, there's a new setting we're going to have to pay attention to, and it's whether the calculator is in degree mode or radian mode. So not critical for today, but since you just brought it up, I'll show you real quick. Um, when you press mode, you go to the fourth option down. One says radians, one says degrees. If you see a number with a little circle above it, then you know that number is in degrees. And if we need to do something on the calculator, we need it to say degrees. I'm going to show you how you know if something is in radians. And then you'd highlight radians and hit enter. Okay, I haven't shown you radians yet, so I'm not going to get into that part. Okay, but in mode, there's an option for radians and degrees. Okay, so let's try, um, let's try some examples. So they want us to draw a picture of the angle and then find two angles that are coterminal, one positive, one negative. And the first angle is 30 degrees. Okay. If we're going to be sketching in standard position, where does the initial side always go? Always put it on the x-axis, positive x-axis. And now, 30 degrees is going to be in the first quadrant. Where roughly did you estimate it? Like halfway? Like where, where's 30? Yeah. yeah, it's below 45. The quadrant is 90. This is one third of the way through the quadrant. Okay, so just draw it you know, the best you can. Maybe something like that. Okay, so 30 degrees. Now we want to find an angle that's coterminal. And positive and negative. So what would be an angle that's coterminal with 30 that's positive? And there's an infinite amount. Just give me the first one you'd get to. 390. 390. Yep. So you can add 360. Or what's an angle that would be coterminal and negative? Negative, what did we say? Negative 330. Negative 330. Just subtract 360. And that's it. At no point are you ever going to be asked to sketch angles exactly and like be graded on like how close did you draw it to 30 degrees. That's not really what trades. Yeah. I found it. Oh, you found it? Yeah. Oh, what's the name of it? Um, you go to now. And then you go to the number and press the zero. It's called remainder. Oh, it's called remainder. Okay. So it gives you the remainder when you divide um, you two numbers. You have to use it right so, um, But it's there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's try another angle. Um, so that's 30. About 145. So here's your initial. Where's the, let's start with the quadrant. What quadrant is 145 going to be in? It's going to be in quadrant two. Now let's narrow that down a little bit. Is it closer to 90? Closer to 180? Or exactly in the middle? Closer to 180, yeah. Okay, we're going to eventually learn that the 45s are 45, 135, 225, 315. So 145 is actually a little closer to 180. Let's start as best you can. So we got 145. And now I want an angle that's coterminal and positive. Five hundred and five. Yep. 
And how would you get an angle that's coterminal and negative? Yeah. And to be clear, when you're doing addition and subtraction, like if you press one of these four buttons over here, it doesn't matter if it says degrees or radians at the top. The only time it matters the degrees or radians is if you start pressing buttons that have the word trig in them, sine, cosine, or tangent. And the inverse sine, inverse cosine, and inverse tangent. Okay. So we'll take 145 minus 360, and it gives you negative 215. Again, I'm putting degree symbols on all these. You have to put a degree symbol on a number if it's supposed to represent degrees. If you write something like this, you just wrote 30 radians. We're going to learn, but radians does not have any label. That's how you know it's radians. If you're talking about an angle and you have a number without anything on it, it's radians. If you want it to be degrees, you put the little circle. Let's look at the uh, last one here. Negative 45 degrees. Okay, what quadrant is my terminal side going to be in for negative 45? It's going to be in 4. Is it going to be closer to the x, closer to the y-axis, or right in the middle? It's right in the middle. 45 is right on, splits the quadrant right in half. I guess you could think about it as having like a, a slope of negative one. We don't really talk about slope when we talk about the side of an angle, but if that helps you think of it, that's what it looks like. All right, so now let's do coterminal. Positive and negative. What would be an angle that is coterminal with that but positive? Yep. 315. And coterminal with negative 45, but negative. Uh, negative 405. Yep, negative 405. Perfect. Okay, so any question on finding a uh, coterminal angle? Okay. Now we're going to talk about some different words we can use. I think I already showed you this one but to describe an angle. Uh, and the first one is an acute angle. What's, uh, what's the definition of an acute angle? There's actually two parts to it. Yeah? Isn't it, it's just less than 90 degrees? Like it's like... So it is less than 90, uh, but I can think of an angle that's less than 90 that is not acute. Okay. So there's one other part to it. It kind of ties in with what I showed you on the... Um, the circle when I was drawing. Yeah? It has to be positive. has to be positive. So if you said negative 10, that's not acute. What is it? Nothing. It doesn't. The definition of acute is 0 to 90. Uh, the next category up is exactly 90. Does anyone know? Let's do it that way. What's the name if it's exactly 90? Right angle. That's a right angle. What's the next category up from there? Obtuse. Obtuse, and that means it's what? It's well, has greater than 90, less than 180. Right, it has to be greater than 90 and less than 180. And when we're dealing with triangles, that's as big as angles get. Can't go bigger than 180. Um, can't even be exactly 180 in a triangle. Because if it was exactly 180, does anyone know what you call that kind of angle? Well, yeah, it's a straight angle. Right? Straight angle, it makes, a, it makes a line. And then bigger than 180. Does anybody know what that's called? It's not a name you hear a lot. It's called a reflex angle. When it gets bigger than 180. Not sure if there's an upper limit on that. If it's bigger than 180 and less than 360 or not. But if you look up reflex angle, it's definitely bigger than 180. Right, but those are the main, main categories. Now these all describe a single angle. Now we're going to talk about a term that describes a pair of angles. And the first term is a pair of angles that are complementary. Does anybody know what it would mean if two angles are complementary? 
And there's actually there's two parts to this definition as well. Yeah. Uh, they have to be the same. Or is no, it, they don't have to be the same. Like supplementary one. No, they don't. They can be different for supplementary as well. Yeah. Comprise to be ninety-three. They have to add up to be ninety, and both of the angles have to be positive. So if you said like negative ten and a hundred, no, that's not complementary. They have to be positive angles and add up to ninety. And then there's another name you usually study with this at the same time. Anyone know the other? Vocabulary word for a pair that connects to complementary. Yep. Supplementary. Supplementary. And what's that? Uh, they add 180. What adds to 180? The, the values of the angles. And what else? They have to be positive. So if you said, what about negative 10 and 190? Nope. That adds to 180, but that's not supplementary. Supplementary has to be positive angles that add to 180. So when you say they have to be positive, do you mean like positive. rounded down? Like if you if you have an angle greater than like 360 or less than zero, like would you get it back to the point where it's like between zero and 360? No, you have to use no. it the way it is. You can't find an angle that is coterminal with it. You got whatever they give you in the problem, that's what you need to use. What if they give you? Like an angle that's bigger than 360 or smaller than zero. Well, if I gave you an angle bigger than 360 and said, like, find the complement, the answer would be there is none. It's too big. Same thing, yeah. It's too big. And if it's less than zero, like, what's the complement of negative 10? There is none. Oh. So negative angles do not have complements or sum. Neither do angles that are bigger than 360. Actually, neither do angles that are bigger than 180. They don't have complements or supplements. All right, so let's try a few examples finding uh, complements and supplements. Okay, 48 degrees. Okay, what is the complement? In other words, what angle would you add to 48 to make it 90? Yep, 42. 42. And what would be the supplement of 48 degrees? Yep, 132. 132. Yep. Right. How about negative 18? What's the complement of negative 18 degrees? Not applicable. There isn't one, yeah. So there is, there's no answer for the complement. How about for the supplement? Also not. There isn't one. So negative angles do not have complements or supplements. <clears throat> All right. And how about x degrees? Uh, I'd actually have to tell you a little bit more. Let's assume that x is less than 90 and greater than 0. Because if it wasn't, you couldn't do this. So if it was x degrees, what's the complement of x? 90 minus x. Okay. It's basically the formula for finding the complement. 90 minus your angle. Yep. And what about the supplement of x degrees? Yep. 180 minus x degrees. Any questions on that? Okay, so last thing we're going to look at is um, how do we use the other way we can measure angles, which is radians. Okay, degrees is fine, uh, but it's not really used in, in higher math. Okay, when you take, if you ever take like a math like beyond pre-calculus, you don't really use degrees. You use radians, right? Especially in calculus, you don't use degrees. So it's just another way to measure an angle. That's what radians is. And if you look at the word radian, does it kind of look like another word that you see in geometry? Yeah, radius. Radius. 
And I'm going to show you there is a connection between radians and a circle. Right? You saw a Greek letter earlier. You saw the Greek letter pi when I was showing you that chart. And pi has to do with circles. So that's, that's the connection. Okay? Radians has to do with a circle. So let me show you um, a picture. All right, so let me fix this a little bit. So what I've drawn in this circle is what's called a central angle. A central angle is just an angle where the center of the angle, or the vertex of the angle, is at the center of the circle. Now, if you draw arc, I'm sorry, if you draw a uh, ray CB, and then you draw a ray CA, that's the initial and the terminal sides of the angle, CB hits the edge of the circle right there, and then CA hits the edge of the circle right there. If you connect point A and B, following the path of the circle. That shape that you get from A to B is called an arc. That's arc AB. Any question on what I've labeled in that diagram? So what I'm going to show you now is basically what does one radian look like? Not how do you convert it between radians and degrees, but just what, what does a picture of one radian look like? Well, if you draw something like that, this angle would be one radian as long as two things measured exactly the same in that picture. If the length of the arc in red and the length of the radius in that circle came out the same, then you would have a picture that is one radian. So that's, that's the definition of a radian. It's when the length of the arc matches the radius of the circle. Now that doesn't always have to be true. I tried to draw that one to scale. I think that, that's a pretty accurate picture for what one radian would look like. But if you add something like this, you draw an angle like that, does this arc look like it's the same length as that radius in blue? No, the arc is a lot smaller this time. So that angle is a lot smaller than one radian. Likewise, I could draw the angle bigger, and then the arc would be bigger than the radius. But if the size of the arc matches the size of the radius, that's a picture of one radian. And that's pretty accurate. That's about what one radian looks like as a picture. You might have kind of guessed it's not going to be a nice number if you wrote it in degrees. Okay, if you wanted to know what what that is in degrees, um, let me show you. It then ends up being uh, 180 divided by pi. It's 57.3 degrees, roughly. But that's why a lot of times we don't write it as a decimal. We leave our answer with pi. So that way it doesn't, we don't have to worry about the decimal. Okay, so any question on what what a radian looks like? Yeah. When, like why and where are they mostly used versus degrees? Uh, when you do um, integration and differentiation in calculus, two operations you learn how to do, uh, the formulas are all in degrees, and are all in radians. And when we do this formula, which we're going to learn later in the week, this is the formula for arc length. The angle in this formula has to be a radian. <coughs> so it's a very simple formula to find arc length as long as your angle is in radians. If your angle is not in radians, then the formula doesn't work. So that's an example where you have to use radians. And that's a better example because we're actually going to do this on Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, so how do we convert between radians and degrees? Well, to figure that out, we basically got to figure this out. 
in one revolution, um, how many degrees are there? 360. So now I want to figure out the question mark. How many radians is that? If I can figure out that question mark, then I will be able to convert between radians and degrees. But you need a fact to start with. For example, that fact right there, one revolution equals 360 degrees. I can use that to figure out anything you want to know between revolutions and degrees. One revolution is 360. So let's say you wanted to know how many degrees in 4.7 revolutions. All I have to do is that. The key is I have this to start with. One revolution is 360 degrees. Now, could I do this? Two revolutions is 720 degrees. Is that true? It doesn't matter what fact you put on this left side. You just have to put something that's true, anything that's true, preferably the simplest thing you can think of. So that's what we need to figure out. Can we get a fact that's true between degrees and radians? Any fact. It right? doesn't matter how big or small the numbers are. I just need something that's true, and then I can work with that. So to figure out a fact that's true, I'm going to show you um, the simplest way to do it on what's called a unit circle. Is this the only way to do it? No. Just like in revolutions to degrees. You can say 1 equals 360. You can say 2 equals 720. You can say 10 revolutions is 3600. You can use any of them. But try to find the simplest one you can. And that's what I'm going to show you. Uh, radians are dependent on the radius, so two circles could have, have different radians, even though like, it's technically the same angle. Well, they have, two circles would have the same amount of radians, but the length of the arc making up the radian could be different, depending on the size of the circle. So what is a radian? A radian is just a measurement like degrees. It measures how far around the circle you've gone. Hmm. So there's always the same number of radians in a full revolution of a circle, just like there's always the same number of degrees. But the distance that you travel could be different. Depends if your circle's this big or this big. Still 360 degrees in both those circles. Just the travel distance is more in the big one. Sure. I'll see you Thursday. So, like... In a circle, there's always 360 degrees, okay? But if I were to walk around this circle, and I were to walk around this circle, I'm still going around 360 degrees, but which one do you have to travel further on? The small one or the big one? The larger circle. Yeah, the larger one. So it's, you're just measuring something different. You're measuring the circumference of the circle, or are you just looking at how many degrees in the circle? Degrees in a circle is always 360, but the circumference can change depending on the size of the circle. So that's the same thing with radians. Radians just measure not the circumference. Radians are measuring how they're measuring like degrees, how much to go all the way around. And it's always the same number to go all the way around a circle in radians. What is the same number? Uh, we're going to figure that out. Okay. That's what's going to go right here. How many radians in 360 degrees? And we're going to figure it out on what's called a unit circle. Um, we could do it on a circle with, that's bigger or smaller than this. It wouldn't make a difference. But a unit circle is easy to work with because of that number. It's just a circle where the radius is 1. That's a unit circle. All right. And here's the fact that we're going to use. In a unit circle, The measure of the angle, so what do I mean by that? Let's draw this. I'm talking about this right here. If you were to take a protractor and measure that angle, and then you were to take a piece of string and measure that distance. 
something special would happen. If this came out to, let's say, uh, 1.3 radians, then this would be exactly 1.3 as well. Feet, whatever unit you were using. If this angle was 2.6 radians, this would be 2.6 feet. If this was 5.9, this would be 5.9. These two things always match each other. The size of the arc and the size of the angle on this type of circle, okay, on a unit circle. So again, on a unit circle, the measure of the angle in radians is the same as the length of the arc, always. So if the angle is 4.2, the arc is 4.2. The angle is 9.7, the arc is 9.7. The two numbers always match each other on a unit circle. So we can use that fact to figure out how many radians are in a full circle. Okay, so how are we going to use that? Well, let's go back up. We know that the arc, okay, or basically the distance traveled on the circle, is equal to the size of the angle if you measure in radians. Okay, let's go back up. <laughs> let's see. The distance that I travel along that circle is equal to the angle that goes all the way around. So if I can find the distance that I just traveled all the way around the circle, that's going to be equal to the measure of the angle in radians that goes around the circle. So how can I find the distance that I traveled all the way around the circle in green? What, what is that distance? It's the circumference. The circumference is just an arc. It's a special arc that goes all the way around. So if we can find the length of the, we can find the length of the circumference, that will be equal to the angle that goes all the way around the circle. And it'll be equal to the angle in radius, which is what we want. So how do we find the circumference of a circle? Yeah. What's the formula for circumference? Yes? I R squared. Um, that's area. So that's a good formula, just not one we need today. Two. It's a great formula. Um, two times pi. Is it so you're saying the circumference is always 6.28? Wait, no. 2 pi would just be 6.28. Well, we all know that pi is exactly 3, so... Yep. Oh, I might be wrong about this. Oh, well. Um, pi times 2 r. Uh, pi... Is it pi times 2 pi r, yeah. The ah. circumference is 2 pi r. You know what? That's cool. So keep, so keep in mind what we're finding. If we can find the length of the arc that goes all the way around the circle, that will be exactly the same number as the number of radians that go all the way around the circle. Okay. So let's see if we can find that length. What's my radius in this circle? One. one. So my circumference is 2 pi times 1, which is how much? Two. Well, just, you can leave it in terms of pi. It's 2 pi. So there are 2 pi units. That's the length of the circumference. What is the circumference the same as? The central the number of radians in one revolution. Exactly. That circumference is the same as the number of radians in one revolution. So the circumference is 2 pi. How many radians in one revolution? 2 pi. 2 pi. Yeah. 2 pi. So in 360 degrees, there are two pi radians. And I can show it to you 
I didn't already on here. 360 degrees comes out to exactly 2 pi radians. You go past it, well, now it starts getting bigger. All right, so that is a true fact. 360 degrees equals 2 pi radians, but we can, we can simplify that a little bit. Um, so we don't, we're not worried about this part. If there's 360 degrees in 2 pi radians, how many degrees in 1 pi? 180. Yep. So instead of saying there's 360 in 2 pi, we could say there's 180 in 1 pi. Right? It makes it a little bit, little bit simpler. This is the same thing I wrote up above. 2 pi radians, 360 degrees. But even that, we, we, we want something better than that. When you give someone a conversion, what number is usually in it to make the conversion for the person as simple as you can? One. One, right? Like if I asked how many feet or how many inches in a foot, most people I think would say there are 12 inches in one foot. That's what they would tell me. You could tell me there's 48 inches in four feet. It's true. It's just more complicated. Just say one foot, 12 inches. One minute is 60 seconds rather than saying 10 minutes is 600 seconds. Simpler to have a one in it. Let's let's get a one on this side. What could you do on each side of that equation to get a one on the right? Divide it by one eighty. So let's divide by one eighty. And if you divide by one eighty on this side, you get one degree equals pi over one eighty radians. One degree equals pi over 180 radians. Now, let's say I wanted a formula for two degrees. What could I multiply each side of this equation by? Yeah. If I go by two and by two, well, now you got a formula for two degrees. Two degrees is two pi over 180 radians. What if I wanted a formula for five degrees? Let's multiply by five. Okay, the number in red is not what's important. This is what's important. If you want to convert any number of degrees to radians, you do two things. You multiply what you're trying to convert by pi, and you divide by 180. Multiply by pi, divide by 180. That's how you convert from degrees to radians. Now, what do you think radians to degrees would be? Divide by pi. Divide by pi. Then multiply by 180. And multiply by 180. It's the reverse. Yep. So it's, it's kind of similar. It can be a little tricky to remember. One of them is times pi. One of them is divide by pi. Times 180. Divide by 180. How do you remember which one is which? Well, it's kind of a, it's an easy way to remember it as long as you can remember what I'm about to tell you. When I say degrees, okay, I want you to connect a certain number with the word degrees. I want you to think of 180. So anytime I say degrees, think of the number 180. Anytime I say radians, I want you to think of pi. Okay, if you can remember those two things, then all of this becomes automatic. Degrees, think 180. Radians, think pi. That summarizes everything. All right, now we'll, we'll just finish up trying a few examples. Does everybody have the steps? Okay. So let's start with 30 degrees. Okay, they want us to convert 30 degrees to radians. Well, what I like to do is let's make 30 a fraction. What could you put in the bottom? One. Yeah, put a one. 
Now to convert it to radians, you have two choices. You're either going to multiply by pi over 180, or it's going to be 180 over pi. It's going to be one of the two. If you don't remember what I just wrote down, look at where degrees is in the fraction we have now. Is degrees in the top or the bottom? It's in the top. We want it to disappear, so we get radians. It's in the top here. Where would it have to go here? It would have to go in the bottom to cancel out. And radians would have to be in the top. Now, I wrote RAD this time. You've got to get used to not seeing RAD. When you have a radian, you don't put any. Okay, just for the first one, I'll, I'll do it. Now, when I say degrees, what number did I say to always connect with degrees? So put the 180 with the degrees. And how about with radians? Hi. Degrees in the top and the bottom cancels. And what's the biggest number that goes into 30 and 180? 30. 30 goes in once, and 30 goes into 180. How many times? Six. So you're left with 1 times pi. And in the denominator, what's 1 times 6? Six. 6. That's how you convert 30 degrees to radians. It's pi over 6. And if I show you on here, it should come out the same way. There you go. 30 degrees is pi over 6. Right, let's, try, uh, let's try another one. 45 degrees. Okay, so first question. Ask yourself, you're trying to get rid of degrees so you can convert to radians. Where does degrees go to cancel out? Bottom. bottom. So what's in the top? Radians, just imagine it says RAD. It's invisible. What number always goes with the degree? And what number always goes in the other spot? Pi. What number goes into both 45 and 180? Yep. How many times does 45 go into 180? Four. So what would be your final answer there? Pi over four. Do not put RAD. You don't put any. Definitely don't put a degree symbol because that's not degrees. Let's try it this way. Now we're going to convert back. Okay, for the first one, I'll put RAD just so you can see it. And you're trying to convert two degrees. We want radians to cancel. So where are we going to put it? Where does it go? Yeah, this time it goes in the bottom. And what goes in the top? Degrees. And the number with degrees is 180. And the number with radians? Pi. Radians cancels out. What else cancels? Pi cancels. And how many times does 2 go into 180? 90. So what are we left with um, this time? 270. 270 degrees. degrees, yep. And that's an example of converting a radian to a degree. Question before we look at the last, last one. So the last one is pretty much the same thing. Uh, it just says to round your answer off. So when you see round, do not leave pi. They want you to write out the decimal. So you're trying to convert degrees to radians. What would go in the bottom? 180 degrees. And what would go in the top? Pi. Now, 580, yeah, you can reduce it if you want. But since you're going to round it, I wouldn't bother. 500 times, and how do you think I'm going to type in pi? Not 3.14. The pi symbol. Yes. Always use the pi symbol so it's not one. Okay, so just stick with 500 times pi and then divide by 180. So that's 
8.73. The pi symbol is second, and then the up arrow for the exponent. Do I put RAD on that? No. OK, so lots of different questions in the homework, but they're all very quick questions. Okay, like find the complement, find the supplement, things like that. Okay, so that's the homework. Again, they're all like find the complement, find the supplement, change the degrees, change the radians. Is this a Q? Yes or no? Is it obtuse? Yes or no? I think you'll probably be able to do that in under 15 minutes. It's pretty quick. So tomorrow we'll go over that, and then we will finish 6.1 part 1, probably start 6.2 part 1, and then we'll finish 6.2 on Isaiah Thursday. Okay. We'll see how it goes.